Welcome to the first course in electronics. I'm glad to have you here and I hope we are going to have plenty of fun together. I try to make the courses as understandable as possible. Sometimes probably this won't work out and that's the reason we have the comment section where you are free to put any question if you have some doubts. The problems that you face will help other students too so don't be afraid to leave a question. I think it's better to start with the most fundamental element which is voltage and current. I believe that having a good foundation is the key to success. Just like a house with a strong foundation that will not collapse, hopefully, if there is an earthquake for example. The chapters, as you will see, are filled with uh, little exams that will test if you paid enough attention to courses. So buckle up and let's get started. Uh. Talking about voltage and current is probably too fundamental, but many people make the mistake to confuse them. So we will use the powerful powerpoint in order to lay down some of the most important ideas, but that doesn't mean that you don't have to pay attention to what I say. So voltage is the difference in electric potential between two points. The difference in electric potential between the two points, like for example voltage, in a static electric field is defined as the work needed per unit of charge to move a test charge between the two points. Did you understand? <laughs> I got you. I was joking. This is not how it work. So let's break the things down in a more human understandable format. Do you see this super complex circuit? What do you see here? Exactly, there's a battery and a lamp. If you are preparing to become an electrical engineer, forget about lamp and battery because these two components have a specific name and that is the battery is called as power source and the lamp is called as load. Because we are not engineers yet, let's just stick with battery and lamp or lightning source for the ease of understanding, but just don't forget what I said. So in order for a lamp to emit light, it needs power, right? When you hear about power in electronics, don't confuse it with the power that a human has to lift up an object even though they are somehow similar. This kind of power that makes the lamp to illuminate, it's like a bridge that makes the connection between the current and voltage. In fact, power is equal to voltage times current, but we are going too far away because we don't know yet what, uh, what voltage is, nor current. So in simple terms, voltage that is provided by this battery is what causes current to flow. But wait a second, how does the current flow in a circuit? The same circuit can be seen here. We have a 5 volts battery and instead of a nicely shaped light bulb, we have a light emitting diode. Don't worry for the moment about this diode, it's here just to emit a red light. We also have a resistor here, but forget about this for, for the moment. As you can see, the yellow tiny squares are moving from the positive side of the battery to the negative side. This is what we call the flow of current. If the voltage of the battery is let's say 0 volts, there will be no current flowing in the circuit anymore. So we can say that voltage is like a pressure that is provided by the battery that pushes current through a conductive loop enabling to do work such as illuminating a light. In brief, voltage is equal to pressure and it's measured in volts. If you are curious, the term volts comes from the Italian physicist Alessandro Volta that lived between 1745 and uh, 1827. I don't know if you already knew, but in electricity's early days, voltage was known as electromotive force. This is why in equations such as Ohm's law, voltage is represented by the symbol E. Soon we will talk about Ohm's law too and you will see that Ohm's law will be one of your best friend in electronics. So let's summarize how this super fancy circuit works. Voltage in the power source, so the potential difference between the battery's two poles is activated, creating pressure that forces electrons or the current, in other words, to flow as current out the battery's positive terminal. Uh, current reaches the light, causing it to glow, and last but not least, current returns to the power source. When I said in this DC circuit, did you understand what I meant? Well, voltage is either alternating current, shortly AC, or direct current, shortly DC voltage. Where did the Australian rock band ACDC get their name from? From alternating current and direct current, of course. <laughs> Both AC and DC describe types of current flow in a circuit. Hmm. Let's try to visualize this different type of current flow in the circuit with the help of our simulator. 
Alright, here we are. The first circuit uses a simple battery. Remember that the battery will always produce a DC voltage, while on the other circuit, we use an AC power source. Again, what you are interested in is how the current, which is represented by these little yellow squares, move in our circuit. I assume you know what an oscilloscope is, and if not, you better look it up on the internet, and if you want to be really a cool person, you should buy one. An oscilloscope is a laboratory instrument commonly used to display and analyze the waveform of electronic signals. In effect, the device draws a graph of the instantaneous signal voltage as a function of time. Of course, in the simulator you won't see an oscilloscope with its connections to the circuit, because we can easily do that by just right-clicking on our voltage source and uh, click on View in Scope. So the first graph shows how the current flows in the first circuit, and the second one shows how the circuit flows in the second circuit. Can you see the difference between the two? In direct current, or DC, the electric charge, which is the current, flows in one direction, right? Electric charge in alternating current, or AC, on the other hand, changes direction periodically. The voltage in AC circuits also periodically reverses because the current changes direction. So most of the digital electronics that you will build will use DC. However, it is important to understand some AC concepts because most homes are wired for AC. So if you plan to connect your uh, TARDIS music box project to an outlet, you will need to convert AC to DC. On the, on the other hand, some household devices such as TVs and computers utilize DC voltage power. They use rectifiers such as that chunky block in a laptop computer's cord to convert AC voltage and current to DC. AC also have some useful properties such as being able to convert voltage levels with a single component, like a, using a transformer, which is why AC was chosen as the primary means to transmit electricity over long distances. So the zero line is here, and the moment the current passes the zero line and goes to, towards negative, the flow of current will be reversed. Now let's just summarize what we have learned so far. So direct current, or shortly DC, travels in a straight line and in one direction only. It is commonly produced by sources of uh, stored energy such as batteries. Sources of DC voltage have positive and negative terminals. Terminals establish polarity in a circuit, and polarity can be used to determine if a circuit is DC or AC. And they are commonly used in, um, I mean DC, so DC current are commonly used in ba battery powered portable equipments like uh, flashlights, cameras, mobile phones, etc. On the other hand, alternating current flows in evenly undulating sine waves. They reverse its direction at uh, regular intervals. We didn't mention uh, this, but alternating current are commonly produced by utilities via generators, where mechanical energy rotation motion powered by um, flowing water, steam, wind, or heat is converted to electrical energy. You will hear almost all of the time that voltage is the potential difference between two points in a circuit. And that's 100% true because the amount of difference, which is expressed in volts, determines how much potential energy exists to move electrons from one specific point to another. The quantity identifies how much work potentially can be done through the circuit. So a household AA alkaline battery, for example, offers 1.5 volts. Typical household electric outlets offer 120 volts, so the greater the voltage in a circuit, the greater its ability to push more electrons and do work. Voltage potential difference can be compared to water stored in a tank. The larger the tank, and the greater its height, and due its potential velocity, right, the greater the water's capacity to create an impact when a valve is opened and the water-like electrons can flow. You might ask yourself, if voltage is a potential difference between two points, how can we measure that? Voltage differences between two points can be measured using voltmeter. So the simulator provides a very nice voltmeter for us. Just right click, go to outputs and labels, and add voltmeter. 
we know that the battery is a 5 volts battery, right? So if we measure the potential difference between its two legs, we will see that the voltmeter shows 5 volts. But how does it show 5 volts? You have to understand that circuits always have a reference voltage, which uh, other voltages in the circuit is compared to. This voltage reference is almost all the time ground, and um, all the circuits need to have one ground at least. This circuit has a ground as well, but it's nothing else but the negative terminal of the battery. We could even connect a ground here, it will not change anything. So this point is 5 volts higher than the ground, and this point is at 5 volts, I mean uh, 0 volts, sorry. So the difference between the two is 5 volts. And this is why voltage is called also as potential difference. But why measuring voltage is so useful? Because knowing the voltage difference between two points often helps you to understand why the circuit works or why it doesn't work. So it's useful when troubleshooting a circuit. On the other hand, <laughs> if we talk about hands, if the voltage is too high and you put your hands inside of a circuit that works with relative high voltages, you risk getting electrocuted, which is very painful and often leads to death. So in order to become a good electrical engineer, you need to have first of all a voltmeter and an oscilloscope.